If the Torah was a novel, Lahavdil, or a TV show, we would be just getting up to the best part. Think about what we've read about the past few weeks. We had a family in strife, brothers who can't get along, attempted murder, famine, exile. The entire little Jewish family has to descend to Egypt, which goes okay at first, but pretty quickly becomes slavery, oppression, suffering, humiliation. Hashem sends Moshe to go speak to Paro. That doesn't go well either at first. And finally, the very end of Parsha Shmos, we discussed it last week, but I want to look at it again. Chapter 6, verse 1, this is how the Parsha concludes. By Yomer Hashem al Moshe, God says to Moshe, Atatir eh, now you will see, Asher eh, Selefaro, what I am going to do to Paro. Ki biyar because with a strong arm he will send them out. Uviyar chazakai yigarshem me'artso, and with a strong hand he will chase them out of his crunchy. See what I'll do to him. He'll be chasing you out of here pretty quickly. And you turn the page to Parshas Ba'ira and you expect it to begin where it left off, and it pretty much does. Ba'idaber lokim al Moshe, God once again speaks to Moshe and says, I am Hashem, the same God who spoke to your forefathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and I'm here for the redemption. He utters those four expressions that we speak about at the Pesach Seder and that symbolize, are symbolized by the four cups of wine. I will take you out, I will save you, I will redeem you, and I will take you to be my nation. I'll bring you into the land of Israel. Everything is going wonderful. The last Pusuk of the first Aliyah of Parshas Vayera seems to be setting up for the epic redemption to begin. God speaks to Moshe and Aaron. Chapter 6, verse 13. And he commands them, he instructs them regarding the Jewish people and Paro, the king of Egypt, to take out the Jewish people from the land of Egypt. You would think the very next puzzle, the very next paragraph is going to be the beginning of the redemption. We call up the Levi for the second Aliyah of Parshas Vaera, and what do we read about? An entire Aliyah of names, of lineage, of family groups, many names that we don't really hear about in any other story in the Torah. Most of these names have already been mentioned before in previous uh, genealogical listings. We read about the sons of Ruvain, Chanoch, and Falu, Chetron, and Carmi. We read about the sons of Shimon, Yimuel, Yamin, Ohad, Yachin, Tzohar, and Shaul. We only go through tri the tribe of Levi because it ends at Moshe and Aaron. But even Levi, we go through Gershon, Kahas, and Merari, the three sons of Levi, and each of their families, many, many names. And my question is, why are these names listed here? We know these names from previous partios, and it just seems to be not just out of place, but it interrupts what's about to be the best part of the story. Coming next, the redemption begins, and then an entire, an, an entire aliyah of family lineage. Why is that necessary? Why is that appropriate? And why is that written dafka here? Refers to discuss this in a commentary on Chumash. If you're interested in another interpretation, it's a great one, of course. But I'd like to, for today at least, suggest a thought of my own. I think that this aliyah is crucial and is answering for us one of the most important questions that we should be thinking about as we read the story of the Geula from Mitzrayim, of God redeeming us from Egypt. The Midrashim emphasized that after 210 years of slavery in a foreign land, B'nai Israel had sunk spiritually to an almost unimaginable depth. The Medrash describes that there are 50 levels of Tumah, 50 levels of impurity or contamination. The 50th, once you hit there, that's literally rock bottom. And B'nai Israel had sunk to level 49. What did we even have left? Very, very little. The Gemara says that as we were crossing Yamsuf, we'll read about it in a couple of weeks, the angels were tining, the angels were complaining protesting and saying to Hashem, why are you saving these people? The Egyptians are idol worshippers and the Jews worship other gods too. And guess what? Hashem didn't really refute that claim. He seems to agree and admit. But in Israel, the Jewish people have pretty much lost their faith. If we can even imagine such a thing and utter such a thing. They weren't complete believers in Hashem anymore. So why did he take us out? Why were we redeemed? What did we have left? I'm often running a little bit behind, so I know I'm a couple weeks late. But I want to share a quick thought about Hanukkah. Hanukkah has one 
mitzvah associated with this special holiday. And that is the mitzvah of lighting candles. As mentioned by the Gemara, ner ish ubeso. The minimum for fulfilling the mitzvah of lighting Hanukkah candles is a one candle per household. We light many candles. We light according to the number of nights. We light according to the number of people in our homes. Everybody lights their own menorah. But on a very basic level, the mitzvah of lighting Hanukkah candles is ner ish ubeso. It's unusual. It's one of the only mitzvahs that is associated with a home. One home can have 14 people and one home can have one person. And the basic mitzvah in each of those homes is fulfilled by lighting one candle. Why is this so? Why is the mitzvah of Hanukkah candles associated with the home, with one's house? Well, if you think about it, the Greeks who tried to assimilate and Hellenize the Jewish people during the Hanukkah story had banned any form of public Torah study or teaching, had banned performing mitzvot in any public way or in any way that they would notice. Shuls were closed, yeshivos were shuttered, and the only thing that we had left, the only thing that we kept alive were the Jewish homes. If you think about it, the heroes of the Hanukkah story, the Hashmonaim, are even referred to as the Bis Hashmonaim. It's a family, the family of Hashmonaim. All we had left were our homes and our families. And therefore, it makes perfect sense that when commemorating this miracle, when celebrating this miracle, we do so in a way that is specially and uniquely tied and connected to our homes, the source of our redemption from the Greeks' attempts to destroy us. Where does that phrase come from, ner ish ubeso? A candle for each person according to his home. It actually, seemingly, I would suggest, comes straight from the Torah from the very beginning, from the first Pasuk, in fact, of Parshas Shmos. The book of Shmos opens, Shmos These are the names of the Jewish people who descended to Egypt. Es Yaakov, Jacob, Ish Ubeso Ba'u. Each person and his home. Ish Ubeso Ba'u came to Egypt. It doesn't say Ner because we're not discussing candles. But the rest of the phrase, Ish Ubeso, comes directly from there. The Sfasemis comments on that Pasuk, that the reason the Torah mentions Ish Ubeso, that each person came down to Mitzrayim, each person and his home, each person and his family, is because the Torah is already teaching us in advance what the source of strength, what the co-op, what the power that B'nai Israel had that kept them alive, that merited their redemption. In Egypt, too, we lost everything. We lost our performance of mitzvot. We lost our traditions and our customs. We lost, unfortunately for many, our belief in God. What did we have left? The Sfas Emes says, the only thing we had left was Ishu Beiso, a Jewish home. Whatever that even meant, a Jewish home, without many of the practices that we would identify with a Jewish home. Nonetheless, Ish Ubeso, each person and his family, each person in his home, it provided the strength for B'nai Israel to survive the horrific exile of spiritual and physical attacks of the Egyptians. I think this is summarized perfectly in one line of a famous Medrash. The Medrash himself wonders, what did B'nai Israel have? What was their zechus? What was their merit? in being redeemed. And there are various versions of this Medrash, but one of the common citations is the Medrash says, Loshinu, there are three things that we didn't change. Loshinu es shemam, es lishonam, v'es malbusham. B'nai Israel may have dropped many practices, may have stopped observing many mitzvot, but three things we didn't change. Our names, our language, and our clothing. None of those are even mitzvot per se. The Torah never says, you must name your child a Jewish name. To me, what that means is we kept certain traditions, certain cultural norms that come and that emanate from Ish Ubeso, from a Jewish home. Think about it. Most of the Torah we learn, most of the halachos that we learn, most of the Gemara that we learn, let's be honest, we learn it in yeshiva. Especially nowadays, we learn it in school. Hopefully we learn at home as well, of course. But most of our Torah learning takes place outside of our home, in a shul, in a school. But your name, 
That's something that comes from your parents. No Rebbe names their student. Your language, how you speak, what language you speak, and the way that you speak, that comes from your home where you learn literally to talk. How you dress, you get dressed in the morning at home. You go to work, yeshiva or shul, wherever you go, wearing the clothes, dressing in the style and the fashion with the attitude that you dress with at home. What the Medrash is saying, if I can summarize it, the common denominator of all of these things, is that even though, tragically, we lost so many of our practices, there was no school, there was no shul, there was no base Medrash open for Torah learning in Mitzrayim, what did we have? We still had a Jewish home. Maybe, perhaps, that's what the Torah is coming to answer for us in the second Aliyah of Parshas Va'era. Hashem says to Moshe, it's about to happen. This is what's going to happen. You're going to go speak to Paro. You and Aaron, the redemption is about to begin. But, pause for one second. Let me remind you how we got here. Why we are about to be redeemed. What Zechus B'nai Israel have left. Why they're even still considered to be B'nai Israel. I know they don't fully believe me anymore. I know that there are so many mitzvahs that they haven't been able to observe. I know that they haven't been giving their baby boys a bris milah. But, Ish Ubeso. They came as a Jewish family with Jewish homes, and that's one thing through the two plus centuries of exile and suffering and slavery that they have maintained. And it reminds us again, Ruvain had sons, and they had families, and Shimon had sons. And guess what? Many of those names are pretty anonymous. We don't know much else about them. You know what we do know about them? Is that they were sons of Ruvain and Shimon, and that they had wives, and they had children, and they had families, and they had descendants. And they passed on the tradition of a Jewish home from parent a child. And it feels a bit cliche, and probably many people have said this, but I think it's certainly one of the things that we have emphasized and learned about and experienced these past few months. It wasn't that long ago that our schools, too, for a very different reason and in a very different way, were closed. Our schools were closed, and we weren't able to learn and practice in the same ways that we've become accustomed to doing so. But what we did re-experience is the power of the Jewish home, how there's one thing that can and never will be closed, it's the source of our strength through so many exiles and through so many good times. And that is the power of the Jewish home. You know, we live in a society where sometimes the, sometimes the very institution of family and marriage and home in the traditional sense is questioned and many consider it to be archaic or unnecessary. And we know better. We know how central and crucial families, homes, healthy, happy, Jewish, bias, how much that really is the center of our people. It's what enabled us to survive the Greeks. It's what enabled us to survive the Egyptians. It's what's provided and given eternality to Klal Yisrael. It was our source of strength then, and it always will be. Have a wonderful week.